be short. Let me introduce myself. My name is Farhan Antado. I'm the, I'm the director of the of the Network uh, and Information Technologies uh, doctorate doctorate program. So basically, the idea is that I will I will just give a, a short reminder of how this will work. Uh, this session. This session is supposed to to have nine pres uh, nine presenters, so nine presentations. It will take around ninety minutes. So the basic idea is that uh, each presenter will have seven to eight minutes to present the, the work. There will be no uh, answers or questions and answers uh, section, so there will there will be no time for that. However, you are suggested to do it or you are encouraged to do it offline afterwards in the during the coffee break time. Yeah. Uh, so in order to do things or to make things simple, uh, we will follow the um, the order that we have in the agenda. Yeah. So what I suggest is that all presenters uh, bear in mind the order. So when the presenter with, uh, who is in front of them is presenting, just try to be ready there. Yeah. Uh, to be here, uh, just in order not to waste the time uh, between two presentations. Yeah. All presentations are supposed to be in the computer. Let's see if that's right. So that's all from my side. Uh, I will be sitting down there. So after five minutes of your presentations, I will let you know that there are two minutes or three minutes uh, remaining. So basically, I will do something like this, like two minutes. This is the time you have uh, to finish. So we can start with the first presenter, who is uh, Julio Cesar Londona Ortega, uh, with the paper, uh, with the work, or with the talk, which is entitled A Randomized Bias Heuristic to Integrate the, Inventor uh, the Inventory Routing Problem with Factful Returns of Returnable uh, Transport Items. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Okay, I'm going to show uh, the word a uh, bias randomized directly local search for the vehicle routing uh, problem with optional behavior. This work is uh, made with uh, Leandro Martins, Ducarmo, uh, Rafael Tordesilla, and Angel Alejandro Juan. Uh, this is online. Uh, an introduction to the vehicle routing problem with Bahar. Uh, the methodology is followed, and the end result and short discussion, and finally, a conclusion and remarks. Okay, uh, in a supply chain, a uh, manager of the logistic uh, must be to schedule uh, several vehicles uh, to uh, meet the demand of most multiple customer and uh, using uh, ways or roads. Um, this problem involves vehicles, depots, customer, human resource, and roads. Uh, the object uh, Functional object uh, is minimize the total cost. This problem is uh, named or recognized as a uh, MP hard. Uh, Christopher uh, 1978, 76. Okay, the situation in particular uh, is this: uh, a truck leaves uh, the depot and goes to the customer. Uh, and then customer uh, products live here. Uh, after the demand occurs, the items of the transport return labels can be uh, uh, available to be collected. After that, the trucks follow to other customer, and again, this situation is repeat. And finally, 
the NT trucks go to the depot. Uh, as can you see, uh, the situation shows that returnable transport items are available to be collected. However, the uh, manager of logistics can not cannot the uh, schedule to pick up the the R RTIs, the turnable transport items, um, as show Martin and Heston and Johansson in the case the Arla Foods or Buster. 10% of the RTIs, RTIs are lost. Uh, Sarkar says that reverse logic is necessary to reduce, to reduce their environmental impacts and improve the use of the resource. And Globe, this, uh, uh, this reference are recently say the management and return of the RTIs might be done appropriately. And la, the situation is, in, is then uh, eliminate this return and schedule uh, the return the, the trough to collect uh, the RTIs. And then uh, empty truck go, go to, goes to the customer to collect and then go to the, goes to the other customer again, again, and finally return to the warehouse with the RTIs uh, to, to do again a, a, new, a new deliveries. This problem is named the vehicle routine problem with Bahaul, and the situation is how to integrate the product delivery decision into the BRP with the return decision to pick up RTIs in a supply chain. Uh, the methodology proposed is a two stage. First, an initial solution uh, is be done after that, it, uh, heuristic, uh, metaheuristic, iterated local cells uh, to improve the initial solution. Uh, for uh, explain this, this algorithm, I, I look, uh, I, I have this case. The short case is, uh, is a song liner, like a whole customer and Bajo el customer and the depot. Uh, in, the, in, the initial, in the initial solution, uh, clara white savings with bias randomized is applied. The process uh, begins to start with the construction of dummy solution. Dummy solution is a tour. Uh, for each uh, customer uh, uh, a travel to round trip from the depot to customer and return to the depot. Uh, after that, uh, saving this is, is be done to connect or to link in uh, nodes, nodes. In this case, uh, we use uh, the savings uh, method to realize a dismerging process uh, for customers uh, don't see good well, for customers use the traditional equation uh, the current right um, the idea is uh, connect uh, the most or uh, higher uh, uh, saving, uh, nodes, nodes with most uh, saving. Again, I have two rows. If for the 
bajo el customer a uh, apply a uh, modify the the question or the savings including a penalty for penalized for don't retu, don't recollect uh, the products okay finally uh, ask uh, the routes uh, line hole by hole can be connected um okay these uh, <coughs> routes uh, and then are be improved with local search and finally this uh, solution initial solution is uh, is go go to the process uh, iterated local search the first step is a perturbation process. Uh, e, uh, excuse me, uh, perturbation process is destroy the part of the solution. Part of solution is reconstruction, is reconstruct again, and apply again local search. Uh, the results, uh, 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 the instance uh, proposed by Todd and Vigo uh, have been used to prove the heuristic. Uh, four class of penalties was used, high cost, half cost, low cost, and lower cost. The results chose uh, import savings, which can be up to 26.4 uh, distance, 23.66% with lowest penalty cost. Only in one instance, the optimal volume could not be obtained. The resulting gap was 1.5% in this instance. Finally, uh, in conclusion, the bias uh, randomization iterated local saves was able to solve the problem and significant savings can be obtained the BRP option I pick up is a NPR problem which offers a new challenges in the field of optimization. And uh, several lines are identified for features research. Uh, for example, multi period or multi depot case, stochastic demands in the customer for, might be considered, and many others. Thank you for your attention. This is the bibliography. Okay, thank you for the presentation, Julio. So let's move to the next one, uh, presented by Antiti Jordan Nidu. Yeah. Let's try to fit to the time available because otherwise, I mean, there are nine presentations, so uh, the delay would be significant at the very, at the end. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Xantipe. I'm uh, on the first year. Uh, my topic concerns uh, Waldorf education. And more specifically, we, will, uh, we would like to um, investigate how we, how we will, sorry. Uh, how we will um, um, develop new media literacy skills and emotional intelligence skills um, by employing imaginative teaching methods. Um, okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the state of the art, the literature review shows that there is a gap in uh, the literature uh, about uh, which imaginative uh, teaching methods can be employed in order to develop media and social emotional skills. Um, also, there is another gap um, in, the in the literature um, about uh, how we will um, um, develop emotional intelligence skills through media skills. And uh, the other gap is uh, the need for uh, conceptualizing uh, the new media literacy skills. 
uh, because uh, so far uh, this literacy uh, concerns uh, only technical skills and our um, aim is uh, to incorporate both uh, cognitive, emotional and motivational elements. Um, the use of technology um, can be um, aug no, the creativity and the imaginative ability can be augmented by the uh, technology and uh, that's why we um, focus on uh, computational thinking which is a, a skill set uh, necessary for every child uh, which can be uh, developed from elementary uh, school to um, from elementary no from uh, early childhood to university um, also um, we will um, uh, complement the media literacy um, concept with uh, emotional motivational and cognitive um, issues and um, the um, the main concept in um, in the research is the, is the value of uh, pedagogy, which can be uh, provide an interface between digital competen uh, competence and the social emotional competence. Um, the research design is the mixed methods design uh, by incorporating uh, both uh, numerical and textual data. Um, I have already um, uh, completed the pilot study uh, in the pre previous, uh, previous month uh, in a traditional school with approximately 80 students. And um, the main study uh, will be conducted in a few months uh, at Waldorf School uh, in a private innovative school and a, a traditional school. Uh, in the students at the late primary uh, school years. Mm. The expected results is um, how we can um, develop emotional intelligence skills and uh, media skills uh, through imagination um, to provide uh, three uh, school models, a Waldorf innovative and uh, traditional school, how uh, they approach um, the imagination and uh, the cultivation of these skills. And uh, finally, to provide some um, recommendations for um, in order to, uh, to integrate these skills uh, and uh, with which methods um, in, our, in the, the school uh, curriculum. Um, okay, that's all. Thanks for the, uh, the attention. Hello. Um, well, good morning. Um, the research I will present to you uh, is part of my thesis, one of the, the articles that um, we're working with. And it's titled Persistence, Dropout, and the Time Factor in Fully Online Higher Education, a qualitative study with first year students. I'm Marlon. Xavier is my surname, uh, which makes me a giddy raro because Xavier is a name here, and my supervisor is Julio Meneses. Uh, well, what are we researching? The objective, the aim, is to explore how first year fully online uh, higher education students experienced and managed their time and how it impacted their persistence, stop out behavior, or drop out. Well, in, very, in a very summarized way, persistence means to persist with the studies, uh, that is not to stop them, not to take a break, and not to abandon, not to drop out them. Stop out behavior means not to re-enroll for, in this case, for one semester. So the student takes a break, but returns in the next semester. 
and dropout uh, in this study means not to re-enroll for two semesters, that is to abandon or withdraw from the studies. Uh, where? Well, uh, at UAC, um, undergrad, different undergrad, undergraduation programs. Uh, UAC, to contextualize, well, all of you know, of course, but it's a fully online open university and the student whose student body, um, the majority of its student body is composed by non-traditional students, that is adults, in this case, um, older than 25 years old, uh, usually with full-time or part-time jobs and family commitments, all of which uh, impact their time, of course. The context of this research is the project Espria, Estudiantes de Primer Año, uh, first year students, uh, which was composed by different interventions uh, aiming to better the student's first year experience. And one of the focus, focuses of uh, Espria was time, time management um, interventions designed to, um, to conduct, conduct it to a better man of their experience with time. Why the justification? Well, high drop dropout rates, not only at WAC, but uh, especially in other open universities, remain a pressing and complex problem. The rates at uh, WAC are very high, 57.6%, uh, uh, and dropout happens mainly during the first year, especially the first semester, which in the first semester, um, it accounts for half of dropout at work. That is um, almost 30% of the students who enroll in their first semester do not come back, which is a, a huge problem. Well, um, but the reasons for, for that, for that phenomenon, uh, especially time constraints and conflicts also poor time management and procrastination, but also a more psychological uh, factor or variable, which is misconceptions about the workload. Uh, many students think that uh, online university is easier, they, don't, they won't have to uh, work a lot and so on, and the system, the online system, the work system, but also impacting on time, home, family and employment employment uh, obligations and conflict, all of which impact on their decision to stop out or drop out. Well, who are we researching? Uh, in this case, 24 first year fully online undergraduate uh, work students who started their studies in September 2017. We um, composed, we chose three main profiles per sisters, that is students who enroll for three consecutive uh, semesters, break or stop out students who leave for one semester, in this case, the second semester, but return, they re-enroll in their third semester and drop out students who do not enroll for two consecutive semesters. Uh, in our research, they enroll for their first semester, but do not come back in the next two semesters. Um, those three profiles and also um, classifying, categorizing uh, with age, dedication and gender or sex, traditional students um, less than 25 years old and non-traditional uh, 25 or more, uh, part-time or full-time dedication and men and women, uh, which makes 24 profiles and 24 participants. How? Well, we employed a qualitative exploratory method uh, in using sem semi-structured in-depth interviews, which are being thematically analyzed. It, this is ongoing. Some preliminary findings vary in a very summarized way. Well, each profile experiences time in different manners and has dissimilar time management skills. That is, um, especially for sisters, they usually have very good time management skills and usually don't have 
uh, time related conflicts. Stopouts and dropouts, they usually have, uh, I'm summarizing a lot, it's, not, it's more complex than that. Um, they usually have medium or bad time management skills. Uh, usually in this uh, sample, we didn't find significant gender differences, okay, between men and women, of course. And time-related factors represent a major issue for persistence, continuance, and dropout behavior. Some data on the profile, the persisters are chosen only the traditional ones, the persisters who are traditional and uh, enrolled part-time. They usually have a 30-hour work week. They work, uh, I don't know if this is jornada completa. I think it's full-time, isn't it? Well, uh, full-time. They have good time management skills. They value a lot. They like. Uh, they usually uh, complement uh, the, the UOC systems. Experience some time conflict, especially during their first semester because they are not used to the system and so on. The full-time ones usually don't don't work, or maybe like very very little. Uh, they enroll in thirty credits usually. Uh, they have procrastination problems, but they succeed. They um, exit or they they are successful. They pass. They have good grades and so on. And they experience stress related to time conflict at the end of the semester, especially uh, in the last um, packs. Everybody know what a pack is? Prova de avaliação continuada, the assessment. And because of um, they have to sit exams. The ones who took a break, usually they are part-time students, full-time students usually don't take breaks. And in this case, there are more women than men. The non-traditional ones, they take breaks mostly because of work conflicts. They don't, like, it comes a time that they realize they can manage, they can juggle different responsibilities because they don't have the time. All right. And do I have uh, one minute more or less? It's just a, uh, oh, that's okay. Um, I would talk about the, the dropouts, but very, um, very fast. Dropouts usually have, uh, they usually don't enroll because of work commitments and family commitments, sometimes uh, financial problems as well. Anyways, uh, the conclusion from these preliminary findings is that the different profiles have different issues regarding time, they experience time differently, and that uh, impacts their studies in a very significant way. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Joana. I'm a PhD student in work sensing, an IoT company based in Barcelona. I'm also part of the wine research group here at UOC. Today, I will present the experimental study we conducted on crystal-free radios. So why did we conduct this study? It's because the IoT market demands shift towards um, a strong focus on miniaturizations, on having devices as small as possible for enabling applications such as activity trackers or wearables, in-body sensors or personal health monitoring, or even applications such as uh, micro robots, uh, artificial brains. Well, we focused on, crystal, on designing radios that do not require any external components and we will see why. This is because the size of a crystal is much bigger than the size of a fully integrated crystal-free uh, wireless sensor node. We can see here the size is that a uh, fully um, constructed wireless sensor node has, and uh, the crystal has a size like at least 10 times bigger. Also removing the crystals means we allow uh, three more than three times size reduction and uh, 10 times reduced power consumption also allows a decrease in size uh, and uh, in price. 
So, our work is focused on a prototype implementation of a crystal-free radio. It has no, no crystals, no phase-locked loops. It uh, integrates a <coughs> IEEE 802.15.4 radio, the microprocessor and all the support hardware needed by the sensor node. And our goal is to enable communication using IEEE 802.15.4. Uh, by enabling communication using this standard, we means maintaining the frequency drift below the 40 ppm limit at all times. This is what the standard requires for the compliant devices. The challenging, the challenges that we are facing, facing are related to the fact that we don't have a PLL. So initiating a communication uh, with a crystal-free radio means that at startup, all oscillators can be way off their nominal value, so you actually don't know the startup frequency of your device. Also, once you manage somehow to control the startup frequency, you can lose calibration at all times because of the temperature influence that is way higher compared to that of a crystal. And also, synthesizing all communication challenge um, is a, it's a challenge because of the lack of, uh, of the crystal and of the fact that the temperature changes uh, normally in an environment, pretty, pretty much. So, uh, our uh, experimental results show that when initiating communication with the crystal-free radio, we are below the beacon channel frequency that we are, we are looking for, that we can see in the middle there in the graph, but we implemented an algorithm that will uh, perform frequency sweep as sweep in order to find the beacon channel. And at the end, the device will be able to lock on the, perform on the setting that returned the best performance in, in terms of uh, the number of received beacons in the network. I forgot to mention that IEEE 15.4 is a standard that uh, in which the nodes periodically, periodically exchange beacons. So actually, we don't add anything to the protocol. We just use the signaling that's already there in the network. So uh, using this uh, algorithm, we managed to uh, calibrate the startup frequency of the radio in order to enable the crystal free radio to actually listen the beacons that are sent in the network. And then in the figure on the right, um, once the node was calibrated and we changed the temperature, we introduced the sensor actually in a temperature cha chamber, we saw that with each degree Celsius that the temperature was changing, the the frequency was accumulating in average of 50 ppm drift. That is way ma more than the, the standard demands. The standard demands having maximum 40 ppm of drift at all times. And we were accumulating 50 ppm with each degree Celsius that the temperature was changing. So uh, we implemented an algorithm in order to try to control this drift. We actually used the, proto uh, the prototype impl implementation of our crystal free radio that's here on the on the um, left side of the figure. That's the development board we used. We also used an open mode to, to send periodic beacons in the network. And our board was trying to, to receive the periodic beacons that were sent by the network first at constant temperature that we showed previously that the board was able to find and lock. And then we introduced this board in a temperature chamber and we shifted the temperature with 20 degrees. Uh, we implemented an algorithm which was trying to compare the received signal of the beacon with an offset of value that, with a hardware value, I mean with a hardware parameter. And any, any offset from the device, from the value the device was looking for was associated with uh, the influence that the temperature was having. So by trying to compare, uh, to control that offset that the board was seeing at every received beacon, we managed to, to control actually the drift. And actually over a 20 degree temperature ramp, we managed to keep the, the radio frequency within the 40 ppm limit that the standard demands. In conclusions, we used a prototype implementation of a crystal free radio. We performed an analysis of frequency stability with time and temperature. We noticed very significant drifts with the temperature. We introduced mechanisms to calibrate the, the frequency at startup, also to try to maintain the, the accuracy against temperature change. And what we saw is that for single channel communication, this crystal free radio is able to, to perform as requested by IEEE 
for standard, and what's left is to do some research on enabling multi-channel communication. Thank you. So I'll speak without the microphone. If anyone cannot hear me, please just say. Uh, so hi, my name is Elisa. I'm from Greece. And I came to speak here about my research, which is going to explore the relationship between Waldorf standard pedagogy, as some people said, neuroeducation and social emotional intelligence. This is all in the scope to find a new role for the teachers. So it all started with a big, big question. Is the education we offer to preschool children appropriate? Do we give them what they need? We have this fast changing world. We have all the things that are happening. Uh, okay, yeah. It's better now. This one, okay. No, it's this one. This one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. all right. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm talking about skills that they need to have, and I don't know if we're really preparing uh, for that. We need them to have imagination, creativity, out-of-the-box thinking, critical thinking, ability to, com to communicate themselves. Do we give them this? So it's all going to be in the transformation of schools to learning organizations. Apart from that, do we take the science in that? Do we take what new education, neuroscience offers in the modern world? Neuroscience offers the research on child and brain development, about their learning, their cognitions. Do teachers know any of this? So my aim is to propose a framework for preschool, which would be based on neuroscience, on world of standard education, and social emotional intelligence. So we start with neuroeducation. Neuroeducation is the educational part of neuroscience. It talks about the importance of learning on the brain, because learning can actually affect the brain. It can change the architecture of the cells. For example, if you go out and you move frequently, you will have a different brain than you used to have before you were out. It also talks about memory retention, how this is, affected, this is affecting learning, and how emotions and social interactions also affect learning. There has been um, a research on storytelling, so in world of children, which showed that oxytocin, the um, regulator of social interactions is higher when they're actually looking at something. We usually uh, measure these uh, things with self-reports or we just observe, but neuroscience can actually give us a way with non-intrusive instruments to measure them. Um, so about social emotional intelligence, I don't know if any of you know this, emotional competence has to do with forming relationships, whereas social competence has to do with self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills. These things are way, way, way more important sometimes than the actual academic results of students. But currently our schools don't pay attention to that as much as they should, especially in preschool age. Uh, it's also very important for teachers to have uh, high levels of social emotional intelligence and as it's easier for them to understand and empathize with their students. So why did I choose the world of education? It shows that uh, there are some things in common with neuroscience as it, as it focuses on the holistic development of children, on creative activities, on imitation of adult activities, on going out to play. These are very important for neuroscience too. And it also talks about the process of renewal, of changing, of doing new things. Uh, these are characteristics of a learning organization. So, World of Education also supports social and emotional development and it's beneficial for a student's academic abilities. So we go here to a new role for the educators. A new teacher needs to know and understand how what he's teaching affects a child. Um, he needs to be able to develop themselves better in social and emotional competencies and also to look out for new opportunities to learn. 
Um, my questions will uh, relate to your education and world of education, teachers and students' social emotional intelligence in world of and non world of schools, in teachers' professional development, and what will be the criteria to identify a learning organization. The hypothesis is that students in Waldorf and Steiner schools have higher levels of engagement and attention during storytelling time. We have higher scores of social and emotional intelligence compared to students of <coughs> sorry, normal education. This also goes to the teachers. Uh, we hypothesize that the teachers have higher uh, scores in social and emotional competencies and focus more on their professional development than in normal schools. Um, I'm intending to do this research in Greece. I'm going to have three schools, one Waldorf Steiner Educational School, one public school and one private kindergarten with an alternative philosophy. And I'm going to also use the teachers and Waldorf teachers here in Spain. Um, we're going to have a mix of methods for this. Um, one of them I'm intending to use is to measure the EEG uh, signals in the schools, then qualitative methods and quantitative focus groups, observation, questionnaires. This is all about getting to understand what's happening now and what things we need to change. So in the end, I'm hoping that I'm going to have a framework which would be a guide, which would be uh, proven to work, which would be easier for the teacher to take and say, hey, now we have a learning organization and all the results are based on our research. Thank you. This one? Hola. Okay. Um, okay, I also feel more comfortable without microphone, but okay, it seems it's mandatory. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, this is my PhD topic in heuristics for designing resilience of climate change under uncertainty scenarios. So, the general topic is supply chain network design. Of course, we can stay here all day <laughs> speaking about supply chain network design, but I can tell you that it's just uh, related to strategic decisions and maybe, of course, um, jointly tactical decisions. But uh, in designing supply chains, uh, supply chains must, must face uh, uncertainty in the parameters of design. And this uncertainty implies risk. Um, nowadays, this risk is related or is affected uh, or is increased by globalization and limits. So, um, this is a definition of supply chain resilience. Because uh, nowadays, resilience is a, is a way to face this risk or these uncertainties in, in designing a supply chain. So this author uh, defines supply chain resilience as the ability of a supply chain to return to its original state or move to a new, more desirable state after being disturbed. This is really, if we, if we merge supply chain resilience with the supply chain network design, design, we have, of course, resilient supply chain network design. But in the literature, uh, it's hard or it's, it's scarce uh, words uh, related with the quantitative approaches of resilient supply chain network design. We can find a lot of qualitative approaches. So this is a, an open challenge to, to address quantitative approaches to design resilient supply chains. Um, okay, this is the first uh, findings of ours, of our literature review. Uh, we can see in blue um, words related to resilient supply chain network design. We can see uh, a clear peak, a clear uh, peak, yes, in the last years of the, of the interest on, in, on this topic. In red, we can see a simulation optimization works related to the more general topic of supply chain network design. This is important for us, these words in red, because, uh, because we cannot find a lot of words 
uh, using simulation optimization uh, tools in resilient supply chains. So uh, we find uh, we look for uh, simulation optimization works in supply chain network design, non-resilient also. Okay, uh, we can find uh, two two kind of risks of risks operational and disruption. We can see these two cycles uh, in this in this in both this uh, type of risks, operational and disruption. And in in your left, yes, your left, you can see uh, modeling approaches, mathematical approaches. Uh, addressing resilient supply chain network designs. We have optimization, simulation, and hybrid. You can see here that papers combining operational and disruption risk have preference in using optimization approaches, not simulation, not hybrid approaches. That is the, the, shadow, the shadow zone in the middle. So using hybrid, hybrid and simulation approaches is a clear open challenge for us. We also look for, uh, as I said before, simulation optimization methods in general supply chain network design, not necessarily resilient. In the X, yes, in the, in the horizontal, we can see uh, simulation approaches, approaches, and in the vertical X, we can see um, solution approaches. We can see exact methods, heuristics, or meta heuristics, and below, discrete event simulation and others. We can see that we have open challenges in use artificial ne neural networks, FUTSI simulation and Monte Carlo simulation. Okay. Of course, we have identified other open challenges in this review. Firstly, uh, modeling uncertainty parameters I mean, we can model uh, answer other uncertainty parameters jointly with demand, because demand is the most address uh, parameter. We can model jointly with demand parameters, uncertain parameters, like cost, capacity, supply, among others. We can also consider multiple objectives, additional to the traditional cost minimization, like uh, sustainability, max maximize sustainability, or maximize resilience. We can eventually uh, build a Pareto frontier. This is an example of other work of a Pareto frontier between multiple objectives. This is uh, some preliminary results of ours um, to, to introduce some flexibility in the, in the facilities we need uh, to allow we need to allow that the the capacities of the facilities can be chosen between uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, alternatives so this is these are some some results i'm i'm making the time short so i'm not going to to deep insight on this and this is our future <laughs> We can consider, like as I said before, multiple objectives for the resilient supply chain network design. We can evaluate the effect of nodes and arcs disruptions in computational time of these algorithms that we are going to design and in the supply chain resilience and cost. And, cost. and we can evaluate the design methods in the context of an agri-food supply chain and in the context of a sustainable supply chain network design. Okay, that's it. Some references, thank you. Thank you, Rafael. So uh, the next presentation will be delivered by David Martinez. And I guess it's in Spanish. Uh, the title is La Evaluación de Desarrollo.
something special. You can use why they not in I can do in Spanish. Whatever. <laughs> okay. Is this one? Okay. Hello, good morning to everyone. I'm David Martinez Maireles. I'm a PhD from the University of Vic. And here is, a, I, I will present my thesis. It's the first year of a thesis. It's called The Evaluation of Student Learning During the Process of Innovation and Improvement of Educational Practice. The origin of this thesis is a print and document research uh, project. It's carried out by uh, two uh, research groups from the OBIC the Diversity Attention Research Group and the Educational Research Group. Um, and it's done in PS School um, in Catalonia. These schools are in the process of, um, in the process of, of introducing uh, educational innovation in cooperative learning, competence teaching and learning, and interdisciplinary learning uh, itineraries. So this thesis is vertebrated by two main objectives. The first, the first one is identify understand and offer proposals for improvement in the evaluation of the student's learning carried out by the teachers in this process of innovation and improvement of inclusive educational practice. And the second main objective is identify and evaluate the impact of the innovation implemented uh, in the evaluation practice by these teachers in this process of innovation and improvement of inclusive educational practice. It's from these two main objectives that the Theoretical study lines come out. The first object is linked to the evaluation practice within a process of innovation of improvement. And we take into account three different dimensions. The evaluation, the definition, functions, moments, and types. Then the levels of configuration and analysis of evaluative practice, evaluative approach, evaluative program, evaluative situation, and evaluative task. And the process of imp improvement of educational pra practice, as I said, Cooperative learning, competence teaching and learning, and interdisciplinary learning itineraries. And for the second main objective, the theoretical line, uh, study line is linked here, is the impact of innovation on evaluative practice. It means evaluate the innovation process per se. Okay, and we take into account the seven levels of impact of educational innovation as uh, teachers' beliefs, student reaction, uh, learning achievements, and others and the three categories of mediators to improve a student's outcome in short and long term. And the author says that the changes are in school structures and processes, changes in the classroom, and changes in the family. So if we go to the design of this study, it's a qualitative descriptive research uh, within the interpretative paradigm based on the case study methodology. The participants are seven centers immersed in the Shimem Educational Innovation Program, and the criteria to choose them are to be in the last year of, uh, of the process of training or assessment of the implementation of education, and then the implementation has been carried out in at least one school stage, uh, infant, primary, or secondary. Then, and for the data collection, that the instruments that we used to collect the data are three. The first one is a semi-structure in the interview. It is divided in three parts. The first, the first part is uh, about the evaluation. The second part is about the changes that the teachers done in the evaluation in their evaluation practice, and the last one is the factors that they think that uh, cause these changes in their evaluation practice. It's to do a whole picture um, about the evaluation practice in these seven different centers. Then uh, there's a collection of events of the evaluation. Uh, it's done to identify different uh, adaptations and to explore um, the different evaluated practice, like uh, the situation, programs, or tasks. Therefore, uh, different documentation will be collected uh, in three different levels center, classroom, and activities, learning and teaching activities, and evaluate, evaluative activities. And at the end, the last uh, data collection instrument is the active questionnaire, is a self-report on evaluation activity of the university teaching uh, staff. And to end this presentation, I went uh, to comment the instruments of data analysis that they are linked to the, to the two main objectives of this uh, study, 
For the first main object, this is uh, the first instrument is an adaptation of Dr. Naranjo of the analysis of assessment situation in, mathemat in mathematics from Coy and others to analyze the different levels of configuration of teacher evaluation practice, program situation, and task. The second instrument is to analyze the improvement process of evaluative practice. The instrument is based on the different dimensions proposed by different authors of the cooperative learning, competence learning and teaching, and the interdisciplinary learning uh, itineraries. And the third instrument is an instrument of analysis created ad hoc in an inductive, deductive way. And it's based in, uh, of, uh, on the, in the answers from the interviews uh, with the teachers. And it's to analyze the factors that have caused the changes in the assessment approach. And to end this presentation, uh, for the second main objective, the instrument uh, is, uh, of that analysis is based on the seven levels of impact of, in of innovation that I present before. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie. So let's move to the next one, uh, uh, presented by Lorena Arellano. Uh, the title is Model for Solving the Structure Code Network uh, Software Administration. Hi, everyone. Um, for me, it's a pleasure to be here, and today I will present our work, my most recent project. And this is, was a collaborative work between my university, Public University of Navarra, and Boku University from Vienna. So the challenge here is say, to manage an emer emergency situation, and the title of my project is Supply Chain Network Management Under Disruption, under disruption Risk. So this is the content of the presentation. First, a motivation, the state of the art, while a brief introduction about humanitarian logistics, problem description, conclusion, and future results. So that work is focused on disaster in rural zones. Um, the objective is try to manage a network where we have plenty of disruption and we don't know exactly how we can arrive from one point to another point. So we are focused on network which um, the street or the connection are break. And the idea is to try to in any way pri prioritize the um, most vulnerable people, for example, old people, that they are not able to move or try to manage the situation. So because of that, um, humanitarian logistics can be um, studied from different two stages, the pre-disaster, which is focused on evacuation protocols or all activity related to how we can prepare uh, a city or a zone in order to manage the, the risk. And the next stage is the post-disaster, which involves all operation related to all uh, activities that we need, to, uh, we need to do in order to reduce the risk and manage the, the situation. So in that particular world, we are focused on response um, operation, where we want to access to a specific point, uh, the victim point, the most vulnerable people. And in the, the general structure of our network, is we have so plenty of points that they don't need to be visited. And there are another point, which are the victim's location, which I need to visit or I need to be sure that uh, I can access to that person. So because of that, we need an initial assessment in order to figure out what is the state of the network and identify where is the location of the victim. After that, we can report, uh, provide information about what is the state of the network and what is the requirement related to the victim. And uh, after that, we can start with uh, deploy all humanitarian aid uh, issues. So that is the current way that they are in the humanitarian aid organization are working. Um, they use unmanned aerial vehicles and they are trying to figure out the, the state of the network by a zigzag um, routing. But the issue there is that they are uh, figure, 
yeah, extracting information from the network in, in a scattered or in a crunch way. So because of that, we are not completely sure what is the state of the network. That uh, means a high operational risk because we can ensure the continuity of the operation thinking on the road network. So uh, because of that, we want to provide, this is the gap uh, in the literature, but the objective here is to provide a guidance in order to rerouting in considering online information or rerouting or made decision on the fly considering online information and try to draw the road for the the, the vehicle. So uh, yes, that some conclusion about um, the work that we did. Uh, we need a clear guidance about the rules in order to route in uh, vehicles such as automated vehicles. We need to provide a strategies uh, able to prior prioritize uh, some particular point and some particular connection. And the objective is try to maximize the accessibility of the coverage of the operation, but minimizing the resource that we are spending. So, and also we want to pro collect and provide information in order to coordinate different humanitarian aid operations. So, um, we need to study different strategies, one related to distance or the resource that we are spending, and other one related to, for example, uh, the service level or maximize the, the coverage. And we need to take care about the dynamics and the risk related to that situation. So that is the work. Um, thank you for your attention. Hello. Okay. Okay. This is the title of my my research. So um, the data of the external evaluation show that a high percentage of the students of Catalonia do not obtain the competence in English language. The department, the Department of Education, based on his plan for the reduction of school, school failure, give instructions to improve the learning of language skills. In public schools, that is my area where I work in, there is still no incidence in oral skills in the same percentage as those writing, developing methodologies of a traditional nature instead of focusing on the learning and personal evolution of the studies. So the need to improve the results of the primary school's pupils in English as a second language is one of the focus of my research. I want as well to examine whether prioritizing reading and listening using ICT has an impact on the productive skills that are speaking and writing, and whether this type of instructional training is more effective than the traditional teaching. I want to note the difference in pupils' motivation as well. I want to uh, uh, make clear the difference between the traditional methodology and the using computer methodology. In traditional methodology, uh, there is not enough exposure to rich input. Every pupil works at the same learning pace, does not have into account the diversity, is not in favor of motivation because it's very boring for pupils. Pupils can be behind. It is a teacher-centered approach and the impact is on receptive skills. So at uh, the use of the pupils book and photocopies is the, is the main activity in the, in the classes. The uh, methodology using the computer offers exposure to a very rich input. Every one of the pupil works at his or her learning pace, has into account different learning necessities and the different intelligences. It favors the motivation of every pupil. Pupils are encouraged to go on learning. It is, uh, it's very important. It is a pupil a center approach, and it has the impact on the productive skills and uses the ICT. The keywords are the learning 
methods, uh, the motivation, the English language skills, and the ICT. The theories that frame this research are the conductivism, the cognitivism, the constructivism, and the connectivism, with Simon as a, as a main exponent. Simon says that we have to be connected and we have to make a, a constructive, uh, constructive methodology because I can add what you have done, adding mine, and we can help to, to others to, to, to build uh, over we have uh, said before. Garner is another theorist like Garner's, the multiple intelligences, Vygotsky's, the near development area, Branner with the scaffolding uh, um, topics, question about the exposition and the output of pupils. Uh, this theory says that we have to expose pupils to, a, to an input a bit more uh, higher uh, than the level that they are in, and we have to avoid the uh, affective filters and the monitor filters that do, do not allow them to, to be aware of what they know and what they are learning and uh, make them there to, to uh, practice or to make a better uh, uh, productions in English. Other authors like Guanyena, who is my tutor and whose works I follow, and I have as an example, Muñoz, uh, Tragan, uh, Tragan, and Spada, say that language is better acquired in early ages, and if there is enough input, uh, children can learn the language in an implicit, uh, implicit way. So we as adults can understand better the structure of the sentences and can learn the subject, the verb, the, the object, uh, minor plus time, but the children, if they are given enough input, can learn implicitly, so is the task as, 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 as a teachers to give uh, tools for them to to learn in an easy way. So uh, the new ways to treat education through ICT in primary school uh, must follow this, uh, these directions. So our uh, objectives and hypotheses of my research are to improve the productive skills uh, through an input base in the receptive skills, to compare the effectiveness of the uh, treatment using the computer, uh, treatment uh, with, a, with a computer, an ICT treatment, versus the one using the traditional methodology, and to value the impact of the ICT is ICT in the motivation for learning English. But it is now that the, uh, when pupils use uh, gadgets and new technologies are um, most motivated than when they are in the, in the uh, learning using the traditional um, methodologies. And well, the methodology I have followed is uh, the following one. Uh, uh, the research is developed in a state school with six graders, uh, where everyone was with a computer individually. They are divided into separated groups. It's a quasi-experimental research. The traditional methodology group acts as a control group, and it is a teacher-centered methodology. And the experimental groups follows a listening and reading computer uh, mediated uh, using the computer treatment. Uh, there is a prayer and a, and a post assessment. The instructional trainer wants to improve the receptive skills to have gains in the productive skills. A1 and A2 level materials from the British Council are used. You can go into the HTTP uh, colon slash slash learn English scenes dot British Council dot org slash skills slash listening if and skills uh, if in practice. This is the page where I, I, I have found these materials, that I, the ones that I am using. And I have I used three assessment sheets, the oral, the writing, and another one that there's, is for filling the, the blanks. This is a comic strip that I have uh, copied from a, a research made by Muñoz et al. Um, I also have passed a survey to test the, motiva the motivation of, of children uh, to compare the, the motivation that have the ones that are um, uh, learning or, or, or with the traditional methodology and the others that are submitted to the treatment. Uh, pupils, when finish their elementary school period, should have acquired the A1 from the Common European Framework of Reference, and this is sixth grade curricula from the Departamento de Educación. The instruments have been passed as a protest to the control group and the experimental group. And there are four different copies from the instruments, uh, from the assessment sheets, and, and they will be exchanged so that any pupil repeats uh, the, the same worksheet, uh, the pretest and the, and the poster. So the, the instruments are similar. Uh, they have the same questions, but the images and the, and the elements that they have to use to, 
to make their oral or writing productions are, are different. So it's a, it's a similar assessment sheet, but not it's not um, exactly the same. So it gives validity to the process. This is a quite experimental design with a control group. This has been cheated, of course, as I said before, in the pre and post evaluation to give ability to the process. The corpus is 150 texts to analyze for the pretext, pretest, and uh, 100 the test, 100 more tests to analyze for the post test. The assessed categories are the ones that I explained. So for the structures and vocabulary exam, uh, I have assessed the fluency, the lexical complexity, the structural complexity, and the accuracy. So for the fluency, there are L1 or invented words, the L2, L1, L2 ratio, and number of syllables. For the lexical complexity, the number of tokens that are the total words, the number of tapes that are the, 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 the unique uh, words, number of sentences, the average sen sentence le length, the lexical density uh, that are the lexical words divided by the total words, the FOC index that has, is, the, is an index that measures the literacy and the uh, to say uh, like this, the, the, the social stage where, where is the, the, the speaker in. Um, and, and uh, lexical words, grammatical words. For the structural complexity, error free to unit, error free as note with errors to unit, and ungrammatical as note. And for higher level of students, because sometimes in, in primary school there are students that for their background uh, they can uh, speak uh, English uh, be, uh, better than, than the, the, the rest of the class. So uh, it can be considered uh, to, to assess error-free coordinate sentences, error-free just about sentences, and error-free subordinated sentences. At the accuracy for the structures and vocabulary exam, the orthographic errors, the syntactic errors. Uh, the the Giroti index is the lexical diversity that divides the types by the square root of tokens. For the comic strip exam, that is the one that I had copied from, from another um, research, I, I have assessed the fluency, that is the analysis of lex, of length, a number of words per bubble, number of L2 and the ratio L1, L2, the grammatical complexity, a number of performs, the lexical variety, the tal the tokens, the types, the lexical words, that are verbs, adverbs, nouns, nouns and qualificative adverbs, the grammatical words that are prepositions, conjunctions, pronouns, and non-qualificative uh, adjectives, and the accuracy that are the errors that the children could could um, could do. And for the oral exam, it is assessed the fluency. That is L1 or invented words, L2, and the ratio L1 and 2, the complexity, but, uh, the number of tokens, types, number of sentences, the units and S notes, and the accuracy that are the correct uh, structures. Well, the statistical data obtained are the mean, the standard deviation, the standard error mean, the, the independent sample t test, and the living test for for variances. So after analyzing the data, it has been found that the averages are comparable for both groups A and B in all cases and in all the measures taken. So for the pretest. Now I'm currently in the phase of transcribing the post-test data and I have to uh, do the, uh, I have to apply the statistical um, um, applicatives. So uh, this fact shows that uh, the two groups start from the same linguistic level when doing the, the pretest, and if there is any difference that I see that after my analysis, uh, they are more likely to be due to the treatment. So uh, the research show gains and an, and an improvement of results of the group submitting to the listening and, and reading treatments if the hypothesis is accomplished. The weaknesses of the research is uh, is the lack of control of, of the inputs of pupils uh, that they receive outside the school. Uh, it is a very small sample because it is a, only a, a, a level, a 6A grade and 6B grade, with uh, 25 uh, pupils each, each group. And it has validity for schools of the same level of complexity. We, we should see if for other, other uh, schools or other kind of schools, uh, uh, the results are, are the same. So this research can help to change the perception of the teachers towards the way of playing their roles inside the, the classroom. So thank you very much. And this is Gemma Domenech, Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. Thank you all for listening to me. And thank you for the INE3 for giving us the opportunity.
Thank you, Gemma, for the presentation. Uh, in principle, uh, the session is over, so this was the last uh, presentation of the of the session. However, we have some time before the lunch, uh, before the coffee break. So perhaps I don't know if there's anyone uh, wishing to ask something to any of the presenters. Is there any question regard, uh, for any of the presenters? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, thank you. Uh, so my question is for, well, for the words that I know better, like Rafael and Julio. So how will you like, or how will you be able to integrate other dimensions into your research? For instance, because you talk a lot about, okay, I'm developing here algorithms, so, you know, to solve problems, uh, uh, for companies and this kind of stuff, but uh, okay, you are taking into account maybe environmental issues. That's that's nice, good. Or also for Lorena, uh, but uh, what about what about the possibility of integrating other dimensions in your research, more social dimensions, like okay, like uh, I don't know, gender issues or uh, you know, uh, social impact of your research, like. Um, you know, uh, how this, this optimization tool that you're developing so nice, they have an impact on society or they, they can take into account the human factor. So how could you integrate human factor, gender issues in your models? Any, any of the three can answer this question? Maybe Lorena? Okay, um, I include in my thesis uh, the social dimension from the insurance company perspective. The idea was try to compute the cost of the accident risk in order to consider in any way the social dimension, ensuring uh, the road safety and improve the, including basically the, the cost related to the operational risk to get an accident. Yes, sure, it's possible. How? Well, um, for example, including uh, gender issues from the decision-making process, for example. In the algorithm, how? Yeah, this is another criteria, and including the construction stage, for example. Yes, where iteratively we insert one element, and for each insertion we evaluate what is the impact of that element from the global perspective. Thank you. Well, uh, in my... Uh, I, I was to, to answer to something to Angel. <laughs> well, uh, in my case, uh, I think that, you know, I, I included sustainability to investigate in the future, and sustainability includes uh, some social issues. Uh, we can include uh, quantitatively, for example, generated employments, for example, for men and for women. So I think that's a, a good way to do it. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I have a question to um, people that presented uh, social work, and I think it's very relevant, their work, because they put the society in front. And we are, let's say, as I'm on the engineering side, I'm on the other side. And in um, these presentations, maybe I missed, or I want to know from you, what are the requirements that you have to the technology so you can do better your research. And when you present results on education, for example, I see them very uh, based on the experience or based on empirical studies. But um, we as developers of technology and as researchers of technology, we miss requirements so we can develop technologies that assess you in your uh, studies. 
Um, do anybody have kind of an idea of, or, or uh, input to us um, so we can focus better our research? Somebody? Um, so I think this is a very, very big question. It, it depends on the uh, field that each one is working on. Um, in my case, where I need staff for the social emotional development. So I need people to explain to you, first to me and then to you, what I need to do. There is a platform, for example, the, which measures social emotional development. It's not like the questionnaires that we used to have. That is based on like virtual reality or stories. So the translation between our two fields is what we're lacking right now. So I need to take the research, the experience, and tell you I need this, this, and this for you to show it to the others. Um, for neuroeducation, you need the easy measurements. So you need technology which is user-friendly for a child. So you need to be able to move around when you're a child. You need portable devices. So I want you to make me portable devices that are not affected by sound or uh, any other noise that is around. So it's small stuff like that that I know that I need to transfer it to you. And this is the, the stuff I know right now. I don't know anyone else. But, uh, but I think this is a, a very good point um, because um, maybe one step we have to do all together is to go to that dimension where you know what you want and you tell us. Or maybe there's people that need to do research on this gap between uh, the fields. So this link is easier. All right, so uh, first, first of all, congratulations to all of you for, for the work you have done. I have a very generic question, which is, do you have any plan for publishing your work? And second question related to that is, have you targeted beforehand any publication avenue, or you are waiting to finish the work and then find an avenue? Thank you. There's someone willing to answer. Well, uh, in my case, my thesis was planned as a, like beforehand in April last year, uh, was planned as a compendium of publications, um, around five papers, five articles. And so, yeah, we, we targeted the, like at least three different publications, one, the, the main one, the, the main target, and two others in case uh, it doesn't work. But uh, yeah, the, the plan was like before I started the doctorate, um, it was the, the arrangement with my supervisor that uh, the, thesis, the thesis would be uh, four, five, six papers, something like that. Oh, just one, one thing. Uh, this, I, I realized that most people uh, presented their whole thesis, yeah. This uh, presentation of mine was just one paper, right? So I, I would have uh, four more, I think, hopefully. Okay, so perhaps just I, I will do the very last question, I will, or at least I will leave it here. Yeah? So an open question. Uh, anyone could, uh, could answer this. Basically, most of you are doing your PhD here at IN3, yeah, or at least uh, at work, yeah? So the basic idea is that here you are supposed to benefit from interdisciplinary work, yeah, interdisciplinary environment. Are you doing so? Are you doing? Are you benefiting from the interdisciplinary number of work of, of groups that you have here at work, etc.? Are you, for instance, from the from the social science? Are you using technology or are you cooperating with technological groups? Not just as using a technology to do your work, but cooperating. Just uh, getting some feedback from them, as more or less uh, Chabi was mentioning. From the technological part, are you trying to see uh, which is the benefit in social terms of your research? Are you doing so? This is my question. So 
this is in honor of the director of IMP. <laughs> is anyone willing to answer? No? Okay, so before finishing, as I'm supposed to do, I, I encourage you to do that, to, uh, to let's say, to endeavor to, to do this, eh, to cooperate with other groups. Oh, I have someone willing to. <laughs> Christina has something to do on that. Yeah. Uh, just in the in the same direction and before the break, uh, and as he said regarding publications, I also do have a question. Are you planning uh, how to fund your uh, research work in the future? Uh, we are going to talk about it after after the break a little bit, uh, but this has also something to do with collaborative research, and I think it's quite important to have this in mind while you are interacting in the in the coffee break and sharing your your research and your activities okay i, I think the, 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 from my point of view a good starting point is this kind of workshops yeah basically here is where you get, you get to know people and you know what they are doing. So I think this is a starting point. So from which you have to you have to do something. Uh, I mean, you have to be proactive. And I think there's a mutual benefit for both fields of uh, of knowledge. So uh, I would urge you, or let's say I would suggest, as uh, actually Christina was doing, uh, to make the most from the coffee breaks. Not only drink some coffee, I will do as well, so don't worry. I mean, there's coffee for everyone, everyone, but at least to benefit from this kind of uh, common, uh, let's say, workshops, uh, to make the most from that. For instance, if there's someone that you think the field of knowledge, not only the presentation uh, this presenter did, but the field of knowledge, you think it could be interesting, it could provide you with some interesting feedback, some, in some interesting knowledge or background for your, uh, your research, feel free to contact him. I mean, you have the email, uh, if it's not here, you have some time here. So it's not that difficult. You have to exploit that. You have to do your own uh, personal network. Yeah? Okay, this is my piece of advice. Yeah. But obviously, everyone has uh, his own way. So I think it's uh, everything is, uh, is done. So we can consider that the session is over. Thank you all of you, particularly the presenters, and okay, there's uh, the, coffee, uh, the coffee break outside. Thank you. Thank you.